Just before we get started, I do want to say that this episode is brought to you by Sheath Underwear. More on them later. Have you ever heard of a man so notorious that an entire town came together to kill him, but no one was ever convicted of the crime? This is the story of Ken Rex McElroy, a violent and cruel criminal who terrorized the residents of Skidmore, Missouri for years until they finally took justice into their own hands. Join me today as we delve into the life and crimes of the man known as the town bully and explore the shocking events that led to his ultimate demise. Hello everybody, welcome back to another brand new episode of The Casual Criminalist. As always, I'm your host, Simon. Welcome, welcome, Ken McElroy. Uh, subject of today's episode. I feel like I've made a video about this before, uh, where it was like, there was some dude and they just hated him and then he was murdered and everyone was like, I didn't see anything, did no, I? don't know what happened to him. Seems like we all got together and murdered him, I guess. Not really, just joking, or are we? That sort of thing. Um, welcome to the show. My name's Simon. Uh, what happens here if you're new? One of my writers, in this case, Emma, she's written me this script. We're going to explore it. We're going to learn it together. I've never read it before. Before. That's how we roll here at the Casual Criminal. So let's just ju uh, jump in, dive in, dive in. <laughs> Hilarious, Simon. You're cracking out the best jokes today. Oh god, here we go. I slept so badly last night. My kid's sick. One of them is. And uh, oh god, they're just like up every hour in the night. And I also went to bed late because I went out with my mates for dinner. <laughs> so why have we done this? Why is my life like this? I'm so tired. But I, I have to make videos. It's my job. You've just got to do your job. You can't have a day off. Let's go. These days we're spoiled for choice when it comes to what to watch when we plunk ourselves down for another TV. Growing up, most of us were limited to whatever was on television at the time. And in our house, at least, renting movies from our local blockbuster oh, was a treat, not a weekly occurrence. I feel like we'd rent a movie maybe as a family like once a week. It does feel very antiquated, doesn't it? It's like one of those things, you know, when I have grandkids or whatever, they're going to be like, you did what? Why would you have to go and physically get data from a location? <laughs> you just have it on your computer in like 72K. By the time DVDs rolled around, we somehow became the owners of an old Western called The Man Who Shot Liberty Valen, starring James Stewart, Lee Marvin, and the legendary John Wayne. Heard of him? It's about a young lawyer called Ransom Stoddard, who Stoddard, sorry, who moves to a small western frontier town called Shinbone. There, he's confronted with Liberty Valance, a murderous outlaw who habitually terrorized the townsfolk. Ransom tries to use the law to bring Valance to justice, but Tom, a local rancher and sharpshooter, tells him that there's only one kind of justice a man like Valance knows, and it involves bullets. Inevitably, Ransom and Valance face off in a duel in full view of the entire town, and despite being a terrible shot and useless with weapons in general. Ransom manages to kill Liberty Valance. As a result, he's hailed as a hero, earning him the respect of the entire town, winning him the girl and launching his political career, ending with him becoming a U.S. senator. <laughs> Movie sounds entertaining, if uh, if not extremely predictable. He even gets the girl. That doesn't happen. It's a great example of frontier justice, but in the real or rather modern world, any kind of vigilante justice is never that rewarding. I don't know. I can think of plenty of examples where vigilante justice would be quite rewarding. <laughs> I wouldn't be above vigilante justice. I think vigilante justice has a place. <laughs> and don't say that there's not, because there's, unless you're like the most economist, like peaceful, like, oh, person in the world, what, you're not gonna be like, I don't know, like, think of some petty example. Like, graffiti people. Like, I'm like, I feel like I'm, I'm too scared and too weak. But if I was a big dude and I saw some dude, like, graffitiing, fight! Like, I just walked walk, walk in along the street the other day, I saw some kid, like, graffitiing on a door, and I'm like, what the fuck is this? It's what are you doing? There's people around. You have no shame. Aren't you worried about getting caught? And I just thought, I don't know, vigilante just slap that kid upside the head. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe I'm just petty. The story of Ken Rex McElroy is a strange one. It shares a lot of similarities with the events that took place in the movie. Because, you see, for almost 10 decades, Ken McElroy had terrorized Skidmore and its surrounding downs and had made a name for himself as a thief, a charm molester, and a bully. I feel like thief and bully are, uh in rather different criminal fields to a bully is not really a crime. It's just being a dick. Are in different fields to, uh, well, child molestation. <laughs> just adjust me. Just like Liberty Valens, he would be shot and killed in full view of over 60 people, but Ken Rackeroy's killers would never step forward, would never officially be publicly identified, and never went to trial for his murder. <laughs> there were 60 witnesses. Ah. Okay, let me interrupt today's episode to take a moment to tell you about something 
Very, very important. Very important. Something that has uh, changed the way I dress. Changed the way that I live my life. I want to talk to you about sheath underwear. You might have heard of them before. They've been a sponsor on this show, some of my other shows previously. And they are absolutely the most comfortable boxer briefs that I've ever worn. I'm not just saying that because they're a sponsor. Sheath started uh, sponsoring me, what, a couple of years ago? And uh, yeah, they've just uh, kind of changed the underwear that I wear. Look, I remember Sheath, I think they started sponsoring me in the summer, and I was like, that's a bit weird that you've made some uh, underwear with this, like, dual pouch system for your man parts, and it was it was very hot outside, and I was like, okay, let's try it out, let's roll around in these, and I'm like, oh, okay, I understand. It's one of those things where you just, like, buy one pair, you'll see what it's about, and uh, then you'll be like, okay, cool, back to the website, let's buy a few more. Look, I know it sounds funny, it's true. Sheath underwear is perfect for staying cool during the summer, and I don't know, you're working out, whatever you're up to, it keeps you fresh. And even if you're not into the dual pouch system, just uh, wear them like normal underwear. It's perfect. It's made out of this stretchy fabric, which is also moisture wicking, which helps you stay cool. They've also got uh, new ones made out of materials like bamboo, mesh, even if you want more cool and comfort. So all you need to do is go to sheathunderwear.com, use my promo code CRIMINALIST, and you'll get 20% off your order. Trust me, it's a game changer, and uh, look, you'll probably end up wearing them every day, won't you? Thank you, Sheath, for sponsoring this video. Again, use the promo code CRIMINALIST for 20% off. There's a link below, and now back to today's video. Within days of his death, journalists and TV crews descended on Skidmore, with one burning question at the forefront of their minds. Who'd killed Ken McElroy? Skidmore had been labelled as a town of vigilante killers, something they resented it, and they infamously stopped giving interviews and stopped talking about the incident in public. But also Harry McLean would spend three years living in Skidmore, and he had an entirely different question on his mind. Why had the people of Skidmore thought it necessary to kill him? His book, In Broad Daylight, is a New York Times bestseller. It's also the only reliable source of information on Ken McElroy's life before the shooting, and provides us with a chilling look into the background of the man whose murder made Skidmore infamous for killing their town bully. And I was talking to uh, Emma about this because I was, I, I, honestly, I've read this before. Normally I go in these completely cold, but I was reading through this and I was like, aren't we relying? I felt like a bit like we were relying on one source too much, which I feel like you don't want to do because it's just not like, okay, well, it feels like you, you're relying too much on someone else's work to create your own work, which I've just always, and it's not, I don't think it's plagiarism. I don't think there's any dodginess. Frank, I'm not doing nothing shady. It just doesn't feel right to me to rely too heavily on one source because then you're kind of just using that other person's work. But I was talking to Emma about this and she was like, well, the book's really good. We don't really cover it very much. And the worst thing, uh, she's like, yeah, most podcasts or whatever who cover this are just like, they don't really mention it or give it enough credit. So I wanted to at the beginning and I wanted to do it throughout as well. So definitely go check out that book because apparently I've not read it. I'll be honest, I'll add it to my list, but apparently it's fantastic, so definitely go check it out. The Life and Crimes of Ken Rex McElroy. And I'm definitely gonna call this guy McElroy because that's how it's spelt, but I looked it up and it's McElroy. Um, so I apologize ahead for all of my uh, butcherings that are gonna happen. Ken Rex McElroy was born on June the 16th, 1934, and was one of 16 children born to Tony and Mabel McElroy. They were poor, even before the Great Depression hit, and they struggled to survive. In the mid-1940s, things were looking up, and the McElroys bought a farm just outside of Skidmore. Three of McElroy's eldest siblings moved to the farm as well, bringing their families with them. And at one point, 18 people were living in the two-bedroom farmhouse. Oh my, the past was the worst. Like when they're just like, everyone's like living in one room. <laughs> I grew up and I was like, wow, there are people who like, uh, no. <laughs> this sounds like super privileged, but I hate, I loved having my own room and the idea of having to share a room with my siblings, I'd be like, what? <laughs> no. Back in the day, there's like 16 people living in one room. Holy shit. Tony wasn't abusive towards his kids, at least not physically. He used to yell at them a lot, but by the time McElroy became a teenager, Tony couldn't be bothered to discipline his kids anymore, and for the most part, McElroy was left to do whatever he pleased. Solid parenting right there. Yell at the kids a little bit. They can't be bothered to yell at them anymore. They do what they want. Uh, yeah, it sounds like this guy's gonna grow up to be a bit of a dick. Spoiler alert. <laughs> This would be bad for us. It seems that at least until he was 15, his father forced McElroy to go to school. Years later, McElroy would tell Charlie, a self-appointed spiritual counselor, that he was poor as a kid and didn't have good clothes to wear to school. School had been tough on him. The older kids picked on him, teasing him and pushing him around. And in the fourth grade, when they found out he couldn't read, they made fun of him. Yeah, this is like, I don't know, in the, in the UK, we all have to wear school uniform. 
to school and like i'm glad for that because otherwise you're gonna like there's gonna be kids and brands and all of this stuff and you'll get this like stratification of the kids and and just like how much money their parents want to waste it's a waste of money you know like i don't know nowadays i've got kids and you go to some stores and it's like oh they have like kids clothes it's like i'll buy some clothes here because i think they're nice and they're like expensive but they'll last a long time and i'll you know I'm not going to grow out of them in six months. But then you're buying them for your kids and then then you're just throwing them away or giving them to charity in like a few months. And I'm like, why would you spend money on this? It just seems insane. Like, who is spending money on this? And it's like, I could. I could, but I'm not. uh, It just seems like an enormous waste of money. That's what I'm saying. In my very long ways, I think school uniforms are nice because they the kids then they're not all stratified based on like how much money they're spending on clothes, which seems weird and snobby and unpleasant they're kids just let them be or maybe it's not like that at all but i get the feeling from american movies that it is by the time mcelroy was 12 he'd outgrown most of his classmates and soon earned himself a reputation as a bully he and his older brother reportedly pulled knives on two other boys during a fight and after that incident the other kids left him alone one of his former classmates told mclean that i don't care who you were you did a mess with him if he came up to you where you were sitting and said hey i want to sit there then you moved he wasn't the biggest kid in class there was one really big kid he must have been six feet and 200 pounds and he never crossed ken's path this is like i have to, the the <laughs> just be having the reputation as the guy who just is is just psycho if you want to be left alone <laughs> just bring a knife to a fight and people they leave you alone because they know you'll go further than them in the afternoons a teenage macro and his best friend john rode around on their horses hunted with his dogs and did whatever they wanted whenever McElroy found that a fence was blocking his way he'd cut it and the two boys would ride on according to mclean the custom was that you had to ask permission to ride across someone else's property McElroy never did that and when a local farmer confronted him about hunting on his property the 14 year old told the farmer to fuck off and they let him be <laughs> hey don't you be hunting on my property fuck off old man <laughs> old man departs at one point, McElroy got himself a 1936 Ford, but he didn't have enough money to refill it with fuel or repair it. According to John, neither of them were strangers to theft at that point, so McElroy started stealing in order to pay for whatever his new ride needed. The two boys would steal grain from unlocked grain silos, fill up the inside of the car until it was full to the windows, and then sell the stolen grain. They siphoned gas from tractors or trucks belonging to their neighbors, and when they needed parts for their car, they'd steal it from another 1936 Ford that belonged to another farmer who lived on the other side of town. These guys just sound like, well, they're like troublemakers now, and then they're gonna go into like full blown crime and apparently child molestation, and then this guy's gonna get murdered, which is uh, pretty sweet. I will enjoy it. According to John, McElroy liked to look presentable and around people he liked and respected, he was well behaved and polite, but he resented the fact that he'd grown up poor and he grew to dislike people who could afford to dress nice, drive new cars, and live in nice homes. And yet he refused to work for a living, as McLean put it if you didn't go to school and you wouldn't work, there was only one other way to get by let me guess let me guess it's crime ken mcelroy started off small he'd drive along the gravel roads eyeing the livestock pens as he passed he'd make note of the condition of the animals where the gates were and how close the pens were to the farmhouse and just how quickly he'd be able to go in and leave without being noticed at around 1 or 2 a.m he'd return dressed in dark clothes and stolen boots and park as close to the animal pens as he could then he'd catch and pick up one of the animals lifting them easily and carrying them over to his truck he'd then take the stolen livestock to a nearby farm discarding the boots along the way and hand the stolen livestock over to an accomplice usually a woman who lived on the farm she would then take the stolen livestock to sale barns or auctions and list them for sale under her own name once the animals were sold off she'd let mcelroy know he'd then come and collect his money repay her for her services in both sex and her piece of their earnings before heading towards the next farm where another bundle of cash was waiting for him by the mid-1960s he was just over 30 years old and had already made a name for himself as a thief he led a gang of teenage boys who stole pigs cattle grain dogs tools and expensive chemicals from farmers supply stores later they would start robbing houses of their furniture as well and mcelroy would jokingly refer to himself as an antique dealer (laughs) sketchy mother a man only referred to as sam s had been uh, working with mcelroy when he was just 14 years old and he admitted that quote there was a bunch of us that stole for him kids that he trusted he would buy whatever we would bring him corn tools air compressors chemicals anything whatever you took him you always got cash on the spot usually one third to one half the price 
There were never any confrontations or disputes. He was always fair with us. But it wasn't just kids that stole for him. He would take his girlfriends out robbing as well, and they'd drive in a caravan, loading the pickup trucks full of stolen livestock or furniture before taking off again. How big is this town? <laughs> and people, it feels like a very small town. But aren't people locking their shit up at this point because they'll be like, oh, that fucking McElroy prick. You leave anything out, he's going to nick it and sell it to your neighbor. Also, wouldn't people just stop buying stuff from him because they know it's stolen? If you buy something you know is stolen, there's a crime there, right? You're buying or handling stolen goods, something like that. So there's not any consequences of this? Or is this a bigger town than we think? If they were seen, they'd know as soon as the police started looking for them, thanks to the top of the line police scanners that McElroy had installed in all of his trucks, and they'd take the back roads and gravel paths to evade the police for as long as possible. It is crazy that you can listen to what the police are saying in their cop cars and stuff. I always thought that's quite bizarre. Why wouldn't they encrypt that? It's too much work. Marvin Dykus was an inspector with the Buchanan County Sheriff's Department in St. Joseph and was one of many police officials who were investigating Ken McElroy. Inspector Dykus would later tell McLean that they all knew the McElroy was a thief. They just couldn't prove it. Still, just start locking shit down. If you've got that Ford that he keeps nicking parts of, put it in a garage. <laughs> do something. Ken McElroy and his network of thieves moved livestock faster than the police could track them down, often arriving just in time to see the animals being sold off at auction. Then it was up to the farmer to prove that the five pigs in the group of almost 500 were theirs. Isn't that... I'm sorry, but haven't we sorted this out? And it's not some sort of magical new technology with GPS trackers. Didn't they just brand pigs and cattle, like, with the logos or, like, the initials of who owns them? I thought that was the thing, which seems a bit... And by a bit, I mean horribly cruel. But that's something that, uh, like, cattle ranchers and pig farmers do, isn't it? Or they use the clips in the ears that you can't take out or something, surely? Missouri didn't require its farmers to brand their animals, so it made it almost impossible for the farmers to prove that the stolen animals had once belonged to them. Yo! <laughs> Just because the government are like, ah, oh, you don't have to brand your animals. If they're getting nicked all the time, how about you do it voluntarily? <laughs> I'd do that, it'd be like attaching a name tag to something. Why wouldn't you do this? It benefits you. It's too much work. According to McLean, the fact was, as McElroy well knew, to make the charges stick, the cops would virtually have to catch him loading someone else's hogs into his truck. Inspector Dykus did manage to identify one of the farms where Ken McElroy kept stolen animals, but when they confronted him, the tall, bulky man refused to let them search his property without a warrant. He simply stared them down and said, if you think you've got a case against me, prove it. Yeah, which is pretty solid. Yeah, that's that's a good thing to do. Like they're like, hey, we want to come and search your property for stolen stuff. It'd be like, fantastic. You have a warrant, I presume, because otherwise, no. And uh, thanks for letting me know that you're going to be coming back with a warrant when you get one, because all that stolen shit is going to be gone by then. Okay, okay, is what I'd be thinking inside his head. What are you doing, police? Why wouldn't you get that warrant first? It is too much work. That phrase can almost be considered one of Ken McElroy's life mottos because the majority of the charges that were brought in against him would be dismissed, leaving him to roam the countryside fighting, drinking, and stealing, his women forever following along at his side. <laughs> okay, he's got like an entourage of women, a harem. Um, interesting. The criminal things, like I feel like there should be a new lease. Just, you know, we've got the rules for criminals, but they're like, normal things that criminals need to, like things criminals need to know number one always 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 get a lawyer even if you're innocent get a lawyer 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 second one you got a warrant i presume <laughs> and just saying no just say no can i come in no you may not can i look in there nope can you do that no 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 always say no ken mcelroy's women ken rex mcelroy was a King bastard. Consider that fair warning that the next section isn't pretty. Okay. When he was younger, Ken McElroy was the definition of tall, dark, and handsome. He had dark, almost black hair and deep blue eyes. He was well built, charming, loved to throw money around like he had hundred dollar bills just growing on trees back home, and he had the bad boy attitude that the girls found irresistible. In 1952, McElroy married Alita. He was 18, she was 16, and the two of them first moved to Denver, then Colorado, and back to St. Joseph's, where Alita's family lived. According to his friend John, McElroy and Alita initially lived in a tiny, dirty flat, and McElroy spent most of his time away from home, stealing, drinking, fighting, and sleeping with other women. I say women, but Ken McElroy had a type. Barry D was another of McElroy's associates, and he recalls having heard McElroy tell the women who flirted with him that but you're too old for me. I like my women young and tender. I like that young meat. <laughs> Classy, dude. You're a real, real class act there. Charming. 
Jesus. There was the 17-year-old Barbara, the 13-year-old Donna, what the fuck, man? And the 15-year-old Sharon, what are you up to? And I don't want to be like, oh, 17's fine, but obviously it's different from 13. <laughs> God damn, dude. Shoot him! Sharon was from a poor family in St. Joseph's. Uh, sorry, she's the 15-year-old. And one night, she and 24-year-old McElroy argued inside his truck. He threatened her with his shotgun, and during their argument, the shotgun went off, tearing into the underside of Sharon's chin. She survived, but her family pressed charges, accusing Ken McElroy of assault with a deadly weapon. What? <laughs> they accused him of assault with a deadly weapon because it seems he assaulted her with a deadly weapon. That makes sense. Remember how I said that the majority of the charges that were brought in against Ken McElroy were dismissed? Well, for some unknown reason, Sharon and her family dropped the charges against McElroy. He divorced his wife, Alita, in 1958, and Sharon became the second Mrs. McElroy. Wait, wait, wait. The guy that she, he shot in the face? The woman that she, he shot in the face? What? That's insanity. How charming is this guy? He must be the king of charming. Jesus. It gets worse. Wait, did she was 15? He shot her in the face and then she married him. Tell me how it gets worse, Emma. Then there was Sally. Sally was 14 years old when she met the 26-year-old Ken. That's fucked up, bruh. Who was her older brother's hunting buddy. He gained her trust by picking her up from school, driving her to where she wanted to be, and buying her whatever she wanted. One night, she was dumped out of his truck, bleeding and crying, looking as if someone had assaulted her. Allegedly, it threatened to kill her father if she didn't do what he wanted, and a few days later, she moved in with him and Sharon. He slept with both of them, played the two girls off against each other, and regularly beat both of them in front of his friends when they said or did anything to set him off. Wait, did you say this guy was charming? What the fuck? What is wrong with you? In 1961, the now 19-year-old Sharon managed to escape the house with her baby daughter, the second child that she'd had with him, and told the police that Ken had locked her and the baby up in the house for two days, taking Sally with him. She told the police and a social worker exactly what had been going on at the house, and they were horrified. The prosecutor laid charges of sexual assault against Ken McElroy, and a warrant was issued for his arrest. Excellent. It gets worse. Then McElroy found out where Sharon was hiding out and confronted her. He told her that if she came home, he'd have their eldest baby, a son, brought back to her. The baby was being raised by one of McElroy's older sisters. She realized that the baby was being neglected and had taken him back to California with her, and we can assume that Sharon would have done anything to see her baby again. So, she had the prosecutors drop the charges against McElroy, went back to the house that she shared with him and Sally, and was beaten up for leaving him in the first place. Sharon would end up having three more children, and Sally had three of her own by the time she was 17. In 1964, the county would end up taking Sally's babies away from her and placing them into foster care, and then she simply disappeared. Ken McElroy had his parental rights taken away, but he couldn't be bothered to find out what had happened to either Sally or the kids. Honestly, um, probably for the better. I'm always like, it's nice when the families stick together. I think having both parents in the pictures generally leads to better outcomes. Except, except when your dad is Ken fucking McElroy. McElroy, god damn it. Years later, her eldest son would eventually track Sally down, and for a while, he'd take care of his mentally broken, depressed, and drug-dependent mother before accepting the fact that nothing and nobody would ever be in a position to truly help her. Oh my god, that's depressing. She's so far gone that there's not, that even her own son is like, nah, she's a lost cause. It would take a very, it would take, uh, I can't imagine ever, like, giving up on my, other than, like, I don't know, like, my grandparents, a couple of them went, like, fully demented. And it's like, well, yeah, obviously, this is just, there's nothing, you know, there's nothing there. But for someone who's just like, what did they say, like depressed and on drugs and all of this and mentally broken, it's like, that's not some, that's not like a, of course, they're physically things, but it's different from dementia, where it's like, well, yeah, we know that there's no coming back from that. That's just like, that's just it. It would take a lot for me to give up on on someone. Soon after Sally left, 32-year-old McElroy would end up leaving Sharon and their four girls who were now staying with his mother and younger brother Tim on the McElroy farm outside of Skidmore. He moved in with the 18-year-old Alice and they lived in her apartment in St. Joseph. Alice had known him for three years and by that point had fallen in love with him and idolized him. <laughs> yeah, idolized the guy who said, you know, this history of assault and crimes and many children and stealing and being a dick. But he's handsome and charming, isn't he? Isn't he? Jesus. But the bright future that she envisioned for the two of them would never come to be. Ken McElroy was still doing whatever he wanted, and he was seldom home. What a surprise, Alice. Who could have seen this coming? 
Good choice. Disappearing for days or weeks at a time, but he expected Alice to be home whenever he did come back. According to Alice, she wasn't even allowed to question him, do something without his permission, or ask anything of him. If she did, he'd beat her until she was black and blue and too ashamed to show her face in town, so she learned to shut her mouth, keep her head down, and just stay out of his way as much as possible. He still had girlfriends in every county, and Alice would tell McLean that women were mere possessions to Ken, and that, quote, the way Ken saw the world, he was always having to prove himself, always having to show that he was more of a man than the next guy, and one of the ways to prove it was by collecting women, the younger the better. Why do I don't know why, like, people, I've got to show that, I've got to show that I'm the top dog. It's like, just don't care that much. It's just better not to care that much about that stuff. Just, just chill. Just chill. Just be like, it's okay. Look, there's always someone bigger than you. There's always someone better than you. No matter who you are, there's going to be someone who's uh, slightly smarter or richer or better looking or whatever. It's always gonna. It's okay. It's okay. <laughs> it's got to accept it. Sharon and her four girls left the farm in 1968 and moved to Florida to live with her mother, and McElroy and Alice took their place. Alice told McLean that she and McElroy's mother, Mabel, grew close, and whenever Mabel would confront her son regarding how he was treating Alice, he'd punish Alice for discussing their personal affairs with his mother. In 1939, the 37-year-old McElroy met Trina McLeod. He was friends with her stepfather, Ronnie, and the two of them hunted together. By all accounts, she was friendly but shy, and she was considered pretty with her blue eyes and light blonde hair. In 1969, she was just 12 years old. What the fuck, man? This is fucked up. It's incredible. He should be shot. Vicky, an old school friend of Trina's, told McLean that, quote, Ken McElroy began coming to the school and sitting outside in his big fancy car and waiting for her. When school was out, Trina would go with him. The school didn't like it, and there was trouble over it, but he kept doing it. Bro, <laughs> times are fucking changed. This is, what, 50-some years ago. It's like, that guy would be in jail. That guy would be in prison with Subway Jared where he belongs. Hopefully for longer, even. This is... Nah, Subway Jarry was really bad. They'll hang out in prison together and maybe get stabbed in the showers. Oh, no! <laughs> Trina's uncle, Russ Johnson, was the deputy sheriff with the Nottoway County Sheriff's Department, and he warned Trina's parents that Ken McElroy was hanging around outside the school talking to their daughter. Trina's mother shrugged it off, saying there was nothing between McElroy and her daughter, but then Trina started skipping school to ride around with McElroy, and her stepfather, Ronnie, confronted McElroy and tried his best to keep Trina away from him. But even he backed down eventually and just allowed McElroy to do whatever he wanted. With his 12-year-old daughter. I have no words. I would not accept this. I would, I would, there would be big consequences. McElroy started picking up Trina from the school bus stop in Skidmore in the mornings and dropping her off again in the afternoons. Vicky told McLean that she'd come back disheveled and crying, and yet the next morning she'd willingly get back into Ken McElroy's car. At the age of just 14, Trina became pregnant and dropped out of school. She would spend most of her pregnancy at the McElroy farm, where both Alice and McElroy's mother helped to look after her. But just like Alice, Trina soon learned to shut up, keep her head down, and do whatever Ken McElroy asked of her. The State of Missouri versus Ken McElroy. There are too many instances when Ken McElroy was taken to court and managed to wrangle himself free, so I'm just going to focus on two of the most notable cases. A year before Trina moved to the farm, a pregnant Alice had had enough of the constant abuse. She took her three-year-old son and ran away, heading back to St. Joseph to live with her mother and stepfather, Otha Embre. McElroy tracked her down and threatened to take their son away from Alice if she didn't come back to the farm, but she refused, going so far as to guard the home with a gun at her side in case McElroy decided to make an appearance. Pretty smart idea. McElroy seems like the sort of guy who'd need to be like, you know, you know back up. <laughs> gun-wise, you know. So, McElroy drove to St. Joseph and shot Alice's stepfather through the living room window, managing to hit him in the leg. It would lead the Buchanan County prosecutor to press a felony assault charge against Ken McElroy, claiming that he had shot Otha in the leg with the intent of doing great bodily harm. And here, McElroy would demonstrate oh, what its first reaction was whenever criminal charges were laid against him or anybody accused him of anything. Otha would later tell McLean that, quote, With Ken, everything was always your fault. If he shot you and you prosecuted him for it, you were the bad guy. He would beat up Alice, beat her silly, and she would complain, and then she was the bad person because she was complaining. He shifted the fault onto the victim, and then the victim became responsible for his own pain. For ten months, Ken McElroy harassed Alice's family, and her stepfather in particular. He'd call the house at least once a day and threatened to kill Otha if they didn't drop the charges against him. Otha started carrying a gun around, and the family were scared to leave the house. On January the 10th, 1973, McElroy confronted Otha in Garland's Tavern. He threatened 
threatened Otho with a knife, telling him once again that he'd kill him if he testified it against him in court. Then he left the tavern, came back with an automatic 12-gauge shotgun, and essentially held everyone in the tavern hostage by locking the doors behind him. I feel like that is the sort of crime that's going to get you at least 10 years in jail. You're taking hostages. That with a gun. That's a major, major crime. I want you to arrest him. He then walked up to Ather, stuck the barrel of the shotgun in his face, and told him, I'm going to kill you unless you swear not to testify. I'm going to start at your feet and shoot all the way up until there's nothing left of you. He'd repeat this threat several times, even going so far as pointing his shotgun into the ground and firing off a round, scaring the already terrified patrons even more, but Otha didn't give in. It's not clear what happened next, but by the time the police arrived, McElroy was gone and the other patrons at the tavern swore that they hadn't seen a thing. But Otha told the officers what had happened. Ken McElroy was arrested and would later be released on a $1,500 bond. But within a few days, a charge was laid against him that claimed that Ken McElroy did, quote, willfully, unlawfully by menace attempt to deter a witness to Wit Otha W. Embray from appearing or giving evidence in a criminal proceeding to wit the prosecution of the said Ken McElroy for the felony crime of felony assault by threatening to kill the said Otha W. Embray. Oh my god, law sometimes gets super wordy, doesn't it? <laughs> it's like, yo, he tried to kill him with a gun. Boom done. To wit, doth crime felony. Ken McElroy hired Richard McFadden, a trial lawyer from Kansas City, to handle the cases against him and paid cash for his services. McFadden would become the first person that McElroy called whenever he was in trouble, and he liked to brag that McFadden was a mob lawyer. On the 2nd of March 1973, felony charge against McElroy was defined as a misdemeanor, namely attempting to bribe a witness not to testify. I have to say, if I was in trouble for that, I'd be like, I want this lawyer. He got that down to a misdemeanor? Shit, dude. This was heard in front of a magistrate on the 27th of April. The bartender who'd been present at the night of the shooting changed his testimony at the last minute, testifying that he hadn't seen a thing that night. Isn't the judge going to be like, bro, bro, did someone come up to you in another bar where you were the patron with a shotgun and be like, I'm going to shoot you all the way up? It's like, no, definitely not. I'm not testifying because I actually forgot everything. <laughs> Come on, legal system, get this guy in prison already, this is a joke! McElroy even admitted that he took a shotgun into the tavern, but claims that it went off accidentally. And then Alice, who'd since moved back to the farm with her son and baby daughter, was brought in as a character witness for Ken McElroy, and claimed that he was, quote, a fine person, an upstanding citizen. Can you imagine the judge is like, so tell us more about him. He's a fine person and an outstanding citizen. And how do you feel about his behavior? He was a fine person and an outstanding citizen. Have you been trained to say this? I would never be trained by such a fine person and outstanding citizen, judge. Would I, judge? Would I? Read between the lines, judge! Despite all of this, the magistrate still found Ken McElroy guilty of trying to bribe a witness. Excellent, and sentenced him to six months in prison. You took people hostage in a bar and threatened to murder someone if they testified against you for other crimes. And you get six months in prison? This lawyer is an absolute king. He's too powerful. But his new lawyer would file an appeal on the 4th of May, which would automatically have resulted in another trial, until which time McElroy would remain out on bail. But one day later, the case files were sealed and nothing else was done to ensure the original sentence was carried out. Why, legal system? Why? Ken McElroy was a free man. He didn't spend one day in prison and all charges against him were dropped. Who's smoking crack? Is it you, judge? What is going on? Why is no one enforcing that? Where are the police being like, weren't you supposed to go to prison? <laughs> What the fuck? But wait, it gets better. Sarcasm is obvious. On the 11th of June, 1973, two weeks after a baby had been born, it was now the 15-year-old Trina's turn to escape. She went to Alice and begged her to take her to her aunt and uncle's house. Alice agreed, loaded her own two children into the car, and the two of them made a run for it. When they got to Trina's aunt Brenda's house, they begged her to let them stay. Brenda agreed, telling the two of them that they had to stay inside until Trina's uncle Russ, the deputy sheriff, could take them somewhere safe. But McElroy tracked them down when they left the house to visit Trina's baby in the hospital. He followed them back to Brenda's house, stood on the sidewalk with a shotgun aimed at the house and yelled, Come on out here, you fucking bitches, or I'll come inside and blow your fucking brains out. I'm sorry, I had to. I had to. I saw that line and I was like, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna go for it, even though it's not really appropriate. And obviously this guy's being a horrible scumbag. But I just had to. He promised Trina that he wouldn't have. I've also got a sore throat because I'm also just getting over a cold myself. For once in my life, I think I gave my cold to the children. Normally it's the other way around. They go to school and get 700 diseases and give them to me. This time I think I got sick and gave it to them because I'm now on the tail end of a cold. 
<coughs> but they are now they are sick, so I feel tired and horrible. He promised Trina that he wouldn't hurt anyone else if they agreed to go home with him, and despite knowing that it was a lie, the two girls gave in. They took Alice's children and went back to the farm with McElroy, where he threatened to kill them if anyone came to rescue them. He beat Alice for a role in helping Trina escape, and he raped Trina at gunpoint. The next day, he loaded Trina and Alice into his truck, drove to Trina's parents' house, and forced her to watch as he shot her dog and burned her parents' house down. This is the guy who should be in prison right now. He should be in prison. But he wasn't in prison because I think someone smoked crack. Scared for their lives, her parents fled Missouri, leaving the 15-year-old Trina with Ken McElroy. What the f*** are you doing, parents? I get the fact that he's scared and he burned your house down, but how about, how about you take your daughter with you? Trina went for a doctor two days after McElroy had raped her, and when the doctor heard her story, he called social services. Doc, doc, you gotta be calling the police son. Trina and her baby were taken in by the county authorities until they could deal with Ken McElroy, and on the 19th of June 1973, Ken McElroy would be charged with rape, arson, assault, and flourishing a deadly weapon. Do you flourish a deadly weapon? Wow. How about that? I feel like you brandish a deadly weapon, but flourish it. la di da all of these charges, however, relied on the testimony of one person, the 15-year-old Trina. She and her baby were living in a foster home, and once again, McElroy managed to track them down. He harassed and terrorized them for months, calling her house and threatening her over the phone, and would sit in his car outside, making sure that Trina saw him waiting for her. In November 1973, the preliminary hearing was held in Nottoway County. When the local magistrate, a resident of Skidmore, heard that Ken McElroy was involved, he refused to judge the case, stating that, I don't want anything to do with that man, or I'll get killed. Judge. Wait, is that a judge? No, a local magistrate. But look, magistrate, you're like a mini judge, right? That's what a magistrate. Do your job! Yes, okay, you're a little bit afraid of it. But that's your job, I'm sorry, but that's what your job is. It's I'm sure the police go out and they're a little bit afraid. Maybe a lot afraid, but it's their job. Firemen, all of these people, they do dangerous jobs. Guess what, magistrate? Fucking grow some balls, coward. <laughs> Coming hard for the magistrate. That left Magistrate Clark Gore from an adjoining county to hear the case. Magistrate Gore found that there was enough evidence to prove that a crime had been committed, and later eight charges of child molestation would be added. They were set to go to trial for October and November 1974, more than a year after the incidents had taken place. Sometime in 1974, Trina, who just started to put her life back together, was placed in her grandparents' care and went to live with them in Kansas. But apparently she wasn't happy there, so she made a decision that she would regret later in her life. She called McElroy and asked him to come and get her. Bruh. What? You people are crazy! But you can't say that Ken McElroy didn't learn from his mistakes. Remember Sharon? No, but I hope you'll tell me, Emma. The one whose family had agreed to let her marry him after he'd shot her with a shotgun. Oh, Jesus, the woman who got shot in the face. What the f*** is going on with this guy? He got like, he got like level 10 on the charisma scale. You know when you choose your sims and you're like, bah, 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 and you give them all points in one category? This guy was specced to high level charisma. And if there was a Machiavellian category, he'd also be up there. Well, McElroy proposed to his lawyer that according to state law, Trina couldn't testify against him in court if he married her. According to McLean, this wasn't actually true. Missouri law did state that a quote, person may not testify in a court of law against his or her spouse. But it also said that a spouse is not prohibited from testifying about crimes committed by the other spouse. Wait, one more time a person may not testify in court of law against his or her spouse a spouse is not prohibited from testifying about crimes committed by the other spouse wait that seems quite contradictory it would simply be harder to convince a jury that McElroy had raped and molested his wife okay McFadden agreed to his client's plan but there was just one issue McElroy was still married to Sharon so McElroy called Sharon and asked her whether she'd grant him a divorce she agreed and a week later Ken McElroy was once again a free man Trina was still underage she was only 16 at this point so McElroy went to pay her mother a little visit and she consented to allowing her 16 year old daughter to marry the 42 year old McElroy I wonder why she consented to that I wonder why. On the 20th of October 1974, Trina McLeod became Trina McElroy, and she signed a statement in front of McFadden in which she stated that she wished to drop any criminal charges that had been made in her name against Ken McElroy. All of the charges against him were dismissed, and he was once again a free man. Alice was told that Trina was now taking her place, and she was more than happy to leave. Alice took her two children, moved to Maryville, and would eventually marry and settle down. At this point, 19 different felony charges had been brought against Ken McElroy within a span of four years and every single one was either dismissed or resulted in McElroy being acquitted because a primary witness had been harassed into either changing their testimony disappearing or simply refusing to testify against him 
<laughs> yeah, those things are all connected though, aren't they? It's like they were they changed their testimony either by being harassed, disappeared, or just refusing, which means they were harassed. Like, come on. They're not just like, oh no, I don't want to anymore. He actually tells actually turns out that Ken's a great dude. It just, you know, he's fine. Although maybe he could have persuaded them of that because he got 10 on the charisma scale. Never turn your back on Ken McElroy. And we know by now that Ken McElroy had no issue threatening people with his shotgun, and that included the police. Dean Stratton was an officer with the Missouri State Highway Patrol, and he was one of many police officers who came face to face with McElroy's shotgun. When he first joined the Highway Patrol, his sergeant told him that, quote, Ken McElroy is a thief and a bully who will use a shotgun. Don't ever trust him, and don't ever turn your back on him. He pulled McElroy over early one morning and noticed that there were four pigs loaded into the back of McElroy's pickup truck. Aware of Ken McElroy's reputation, Stratton made the mistake of asking McElroy whether he'd stolen the pigs. McElroy pulled out a shotgun, pointed it in Stratton's face, and Stratton knew that if he made a reach for his pistol, he'd be dead. He's pointing a shotgun in the face of a police officer. That, again, I feel like that is 10 years, 15 years minimum in prison. These are major crimes. So instead, he took a step back and allowed Ken McElroy to go on his way. On the afternoon of the 27th of July, 1976, Romain Henry, a farmer from Skidmore, had just returned to his house when his son told him that someone was firing a shotgun on their property. Romain got back into his pickup and went to investigate. He recognized Ken McElroy's green Dodge pickup that was parked on the gravel road and decided that it was best to just pretend that he hadn't seen anything and head on home. Honestly, it's just probably smart, isn't it? Just call the police. Don't get involved with this guy because he'll he's he'll he'll do it. But then McElroy stepped into the middle of the road and pointed his shotgun at Remain's pickup truck. Remain came to a stop and McElroy walked up to the passenger door. It was locked, so Remain unlocked the door, allowing McElroy to lean in and point his shotgun at him. McElroy asked Remain whether he'd been to the McElroy farm recently. When Remain denied it, McElroy shot him in the stomach. Jesus Christ. Remain ducked just as another shot went off, and this time he sustained a gash in his forehead and cheek. McElroy's shotgun jammed on the third shot, and while he struggled with his shotgun, Remain sped off. McElroy got into his pickup, and the green Dodge chased after Remain for several miles before falling back, drawing the attention of more than one farmer along the way. Remain managed to make it back to his house, and his wife would end up erasing him to the hospital in Maryville with him in the passenger seat. One of the shotgun pellets had torn a hole in his side, and there were seven pellets in his abdominal wall. He had to have surgery to cut away the damaged skin, and the two gashes in his face had to be stitched up yeah gay shot is brutal this guy made it off lightly ken mcelroy was i obviously don't want to get shot but it could have been worse much worse ken mcelroy was arrested the next day and charged with feloniously assaulting remain henry with the intent to kill him or do great bodily harm excellent so let's put him in jail forever goodbye forever when he appeared in court, McElroy simply said that he wasn't there that day and that he didn't do it. Five people would testify that they'd seen Ken McElroy that afternoon. Three of them were local farmers who'd seen McElroy's green Dodge driving down the gravel road alongside the Henry farm that afternoon, and two others, friends of McElroy from Iowa, stated that he was on his farm that afternoon supervising some carpentry work that they were doing for him. Faden, McElroy's lawyer, managed to get the hearing postponed until August 1977, more than a year later, and McElroy used that time to terrify the witnesses, including Romaine Henry and his wife in much the same way that it terrorized Alice and Trina. Why can't we just... I know the bail thing is a thing where it's just like you... Because it's slightly insane, America, but you can pay someone a bunch of money and then you get to hang out outside while you await for your trial. Why Why don't they just deny it? Because he's got a history of witness intimidation. Why not just deny him bail? And he'll also probably then want to get the trial done sooner because no one wants to sit around in, like, prison when you're not convicted of a crime. He'd drive past the Henry farm, making sure that either Remain or his wife saw him. He would shine his flashlight into their bedroom windows at night and sit on his truck outside their house for hours on end. The other witnesses got the same treatment, and McElroy spread the rumor that if they testified against him, they would be killed. The Henrys and the other three witnesses from Skidmore would all go to the police for help, but no help ever came. Protect these people, police. What are you up to? Eventually, though, McFadden would seemingly manage to convince the jury that the witnesses were unreliable by making it seem that they weren't even sure or when exactly they'd seen Ken McElroy that afternoon. The jury would end up deciding that Ken McElroy wasn't guilty of shooting Remain Henry, and soon after, a rumor spread that some of the jurors had been threatened as well. What a shocking surprise there. It's unbelievable. Oh, once again, Ken McElroy was allowed to walk free, and the residents of Skidmore were left to wonder how it was that Ken McElroy could shoot someone point blank and not go to prison. It's insane. That's attempted murder, and it pointed a shotgun in the face of a police officer. What the f***? Welcome to Skidmore, population 440. Okay, so it's a tiny town. In 19... How is this? 
It's so few people. And they're just... I mean, we sort of know how this end where they will get together and kill him, right? So... <laughs> Like, everyone's intimately familiar with what a prick this dude is. He's committed probably crimes against most of them. In 1980, Skidmore was just another small town in rural America, if you could even call it a town. Since its establishment in July 1880, Skidmore had never had more than 600 citizens living there. Originally, its founder, Martin A. Skidmore, had agreed to hand 20 acres of his land over to Kansas City, St. Joseph, and Council Bluffs Railroad, hoping that access to the railway would turn Skidmore into a thriving trading hub. But the invention of the automobile, the closing of the railways, and the Great Depression all played a factor in halting Skidmore's growth, and as a result, Skidmore had a population of just 440 people in 1981. Skidmore's residents were mostly comprised of people whose families had lived in the area since 1880, and according to McLean, the people of Skidmore are mostly law-abiding, self-reliant, and hard-working people who tend to keep to themselves. The town had a mayor and a board of aldermen, aka municipal council, and according to McLean, they met once a month to discuss various issues such as, quote, loose dogs, vandalism, cable TV rates, water and sewage systems, road grading, and missing street signs. I feel like they should also be discussing Ken McElroy and how they're fun. This little town of 440 people has all these judges and shit and magistrates and all of that and jails. It's only 440 people. Skidmore didn't have a police service. Oh, okay. So I guess they're being covered by like a larger state or a county, county like thing where there's, uh, you know, several towns get together and they're like, cool, you'll be the judge for all of us. But at the time, they did have a marshal named David Dunbar, even though he didn't have much to do. The crimes that did take place in town were usually petty, things like vandalism, bar fights, kids climbing the water tower and peeing on passers-by, or teenagers towing sheds down the main street on Halloween. If something big did happen, they had to call the Nottoway County Sheriff's Department, and then it would take more than half an hour before the sheriff's deputies finally arrived on the scene. But what aspect of small town life was as true in Skidmore as it was in any other small town. You couldn't keep a secret in Skidmore. According to McLean, quote, a farmer passing through town can tell who is shopping for groceries, who is drinking coffee, who is in the tavern, who is buying fertilizer, and who is applying for a loan just by glancing at the location of the vehicles parked up and down Elm Street. I wouldn't like this. Like this small village thing and everyone is in everyone else's business. I quite like living in a bigger city where it's like no one knows who you are. You're just kind of drifting through, you know, just it's much more impersonal. And I like that impersonalness. McElroy and Trina lived just outside of Skidmore. And Trina and her three kids would often go into town to do some shopping. Three of Sharon's daughters had moved back to Skidmore to live with McElroy and Trina. And the teenagers would often drive McElroy's pickup trucks into town and form part of his caravan. Oh, yeah, his thieving caravan of nicking shit. On the 25th of April 1980, Debbie McElroy walked into the B&B grocery, followed by the four-year-old Alita, Trina's daughter. Debbie bought a candy bar, a sack of cookies, and a pack of cigarettes. Alita sidled up to her, holding a few pieces of candy. Debbie handed the cashier, Evelyn Sumi, money for her purchase, and Evelyn realized that she wasn't intending to pay for Alita's candy. Debbie told Evelyn that the little girl had her own money, and Evelyn finalized the transaction, handing Debbie her change. As the two girls left, Evelyn noted that Alita was still holding the candy. Debbie took the candy from her, upsetting the four-year-old, and when Debbie turned to leave the store, Alita grabbed another handful of candy. What is going on? So the kid's nicking the candy? Okay. Once again, Evelyn called out to Debbie to let her know that Alita still had the candy in her hand. Debbie grabbed the candy, and Alita threw a tantrum as Debbie dragged her out of the store. Kids throw tantrums, though. It's like, yeah, what well, you can't nick okay? <laughs> Lois Burnkamp, one of the owners of the store, walked up to Evelyn to ask her what had happened. Evelyn was still explaining when an older girl stormed into the store. She was Tammy Sue McElroy, Ken's eldest daughter, and she confronted the two women, demanding to have her money back and claiming that they'd accused the little sister of shoplifting. The more the two women tried to convince Tammy that there'd been a misunderstanding, the more insistent she got that they weren't thieves, and before storming out of the store, she declared that nobody from our family will ever buy anything in this store again. Wait, so she's like, she comes along and it's like, no, 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 you, you said that my daughter was, or well, my sister was stealing. And it's like, no, he didn't. She even didn't say that. No one thought this. What are you talking about? Evelyn explained that she thought the two girls belonged to Ken McElroy, but Lois wasn't familiar with him. She knew who he was since she'd grown up in Skidmore, but she and her husband had only just moved back to Skidmore after living in Nebraska for years. Since McElroy didn't come into town much, she'd never met him before. 20 minutes later, a large man entered the store. At 46, Ken was no longer the attractive man that he'd been when he was 30. He was overweight. He'd dyed his dark brown hair black, kept it oiled and slicked back, and he had long sideburns. He looked downright mean. He held an open pocket knife chest high and used it to point at Lois, 
when he walked up to her. Husband, 69-year-old Ernest Bo Bowenkamp, had been working behind the meat counter, but he walked up to stand next to his wife when McElroy walked into the store, and he asked McElroy to put the knife away. Of course, McElroy refused, and then Trina stormed into the store, yelling and swearing at the couple, demanding to know who had accused her baby girl of stealing. Eventually, McElroy ordered her to be quiet, and Evelyn and the Bowenkamps were able to explain what had happened. Trina calmed down, realizing that it was just a misunderstanding, but McElroy turned to Lois and ordered a packet of camels. Lois, the strong, confident, and stubborn woman that she was, lifted her chin, looked McElroy in the eye, and said, Sir, I understand that nobody in your family wishes to do business in this store anymore. He's got a knife. Just give him his f***ing cigarettes and hope he pays for them. I mean, I know, obviously, you're in the right, he's in the wrong, he has a weapon, and he's a psycho. Just give him his f***ing cigarettes and just be done with it now when i first heard her response i immediately knew that it had been a mistake yeah no shit, emma she was fully within her right to refuse to sell anything to him he just threatened her with a knife after all but she didn't know ken mcelroy and she didn't know that despite his hulking size he suffered from small man syndrome worst of all he was trigger happy and wouldn't hesitate to become violent just because she was a woman it sounds like he he doesn't need an excuse to get violent lois would tell mclean that mcelroy had simply responded with that's right but it could just as easily have been interpreted as is that right which was a challenge to lois's statement mcelroy would tell different versions of uh, what had happened that afternoon he claimed that Bo had thrown his girls out of the store calling them a bunch of thieving mcelroys he told another friend that lois had told his girls that they didn't need their kind of people in the store and that they didn't want their business <laughs> honestly fair enough if i ran a store i'd be like i don't want your business get out of here all of your money is also just money that you've made from stealing from my friends and neighbors dickhead in short mcelroy was convinced that the rich bowen camps considered his family to be below them um well you're definitely below them mcelroy because you're a prick we all agree everybody agrees right and then the nightmare started mcelroy started terrorizing the bowen camps he had trina and his daughters follow him in various vehicles and they'd slowly drive past the bowen camps house their rifles on display lois called russ johnson trina's uncle the deputy sheriff and told him what was going on russ didn't offer any help and told the bowen camps that he won't do nothing oh he may harass you a little bit but he won't do anything serious lazy ass sheriff during the day mcelroy would sit in his car outside the b&b grocery and stare at the bowen camps don't you have anything better to do at night he'd sit in his truck outside the house or slowly drive down their street one evening he drove past the house noticing that they were watching him through the window he fired two shots into the sky outside the house before driving away half an hour later he was back and fired off another shot by the next morning the entire town knew that mcelroy had kicked his harassment up a notch and lois drove to maryville to report the incident but nothing was done about it two days later mcelroy would once again drive past the bowen camp's house at 7 p.m and fire his shotgun twice later that night when bow and lois were already in bed he would fire three more shots at the house by this point the bowen camp's didn't see the point in calling the police instead lois bought a 20-gauge shotgun that she kept in the bedroom <laughs> legend <laughs> The police are doing anything. Well, I guess I'm a fat old gun. McElroy would drink at his favorite bars in the nearby towns and brag about how he was terrorizing the Bowen camps. He especially had it in for the 69 year old Bo, whom McElroy considered to be weak, since Lois, who was 20 years younger than her husband, was the one who'd stood up to him. He would tell everyone who would listen that that old man needs a lesson taught to him. I know he's an old man, but he still needs a lesson taught to him. No one tells Ken McElroy what to do. The 8th of July, 1980, was Bo's 70th birthday, and at 7.30 that evening, he was at the B&B grocery, meeting up with the electrician who they'd called to fix the air conditioner. He was inside the door at the back of the store, cutting up cardboard boxes with a butcher's knife, and when he saw McElroy's green Dodge park in front of the post office. For an hour or so, McElroy just watched Bo. Then he drove around the block, came in from behind Bo, and parked next to the loading dock. Bo placed the butcher's knife down when McElroy got out of his truck and walked out onto the loading dock. McElroy asked Bo whether he'd called the police on him yet, and Bo said that he hadn't. McElroy asked whether Bo was mad at him, and Bo said that he wasn't. Then Bo told McElroy, This is private property, you know, and we want you off it. McElroy responded with his usual, You can't tell me what to do attitude, and he walked away. Bo watched as McElroy walked up to four boys who were watching their exchange, talked to them for a bit, handed them money and then off the four of them went. Bo went back to the store and picked up his butcher's knife to continue cutting up boxes. He heard McElroy rifling around in his truck, and when Bo turned around, he was staring down the twin barrels of McElroy's shotgun. Bo ducked just as the shot went off. McElroy's a full-on psycho. What the fuck? I suggest to shoot him. 
Down in the tavern, two of the boys had just finished explaining to the owner of the tavern, Greg Clement, that McElroy had sent them away to go and buy themselves some cold drinks when the boom from the shotgun sounded. Greg yelled at Red Smith the barman to lock the doors, and they waited to see what McElroy would do next. Steve Day, one of the four boys, left through the back door of the tavern. After confirming that McElroy's truck was nowhere in sight, ran up to the back of the B&B grocery and found Bo lying just inside the back door. He'd been shot in the neck, but he was still alive, and Steve ran back to the tavern, pounded on the locked door, and yelled, The old man's been shot! The news propelled the patrons of the tavern into action. Greg Clement called for an ambulance and ordered Steve and one of his friends to go and find David Dunbar, the marshal. Within minutes, the whole of Skidmore knew that Ken McElroy had shot Bo Bowencamp. Bo was rushed to the hospital in Maryville, and the shooting was reported to the Nottoway County Sheriff's Department, who launched a manhunt for Ken McElroy. Surely this has got to be. We know he doesn't end up in prison, though, right? So how the f*** does he keep getting away with these major, major crimes? The orders and confirmations and authorization codes for the manhunt were issued over the police radios, informing McElroy of exactly where the police were, what they were planning, and which roads to avoid. Again, why aren't they encrypting this radio traffic? McElroy didn't plan on staying around long enough to get arrested, so he went back to the farm, picked Trina up, and the two of them headed south towards Fillmore, from where they could head toward Kansas. Corporal Dean Stratton was the one to capture Ken McElroy. Stratton had an eye McElroy ever since he had threatened him with a shotgun years before, and he knew that as soon as McElroy heard the police were looking for him, he tried to get out of Missouri as fast as possible and hide out in either Nebraska or Kansas until the worst of it was over. So when the Green Dodge entered Fillmore, Stratton was waiting for him, a chase ensued. Stratton let the rest of the officers know that he tracked McElroy down and called for backup, fully aware that McElroy was listening in. The police were planning on encircling Ken McElroy and shouted their orders over the radio, cautioning all officers that McElroy was armed and dangerous, which we all know means shoot that bastard if you have to. Probably realizing that it was going to end badly for him if he resisted, McElroy pulled over and allowed Stratton to approach his pickup and order him to get out. But when Stratton told Ken McElroy that he was under arrest for a shooting in Skidmore, McElroy calmly asked who'd been shot and then denied having been anywhere near Skidmore. Trina, who'd also been ordered at gunpoint to get out of the pickup, reiterated McElroy's claims that he hadn't been in Skidmore. He'd been with her all afternoon. A quick search of the truck also didn't provide them with any evidence. McElroy had removed all of his usual guns and ammunition from the Dodge, and they'd have to issue a warrant to search his property for the shotgun that he'd used to shoot Bo Bowenkamp. When they finally had him in an interrogation room and questioned him about the shooting, McElroy, the seasoned criminal, simply said, I don't know anything about it. It wasn't me. I didn't shoot anybody. I want to talk to my lawyer. Which is, uh, yes, yeah, solid. Solid. Deny, 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 lawyer. Yes, it's not fun when criminals follow the rules, is it? It's not. It's much more fun than when they're stupid. The next day, Ken McElroy was charged with the Class A felony of assault in the first degree and was released on a $30,000 bail bond under the condition that he would keep the peace and be of good behavior until the case was disposed of. Are you joking? It's Ken McElroy. Good behavior is not something he does. And it's also $30,000 of stolen money. How about we just keep him in prison? I don't know, but they ought to hang him. This is insane. His preliminary hearing was set for the 18th of August 1980, and that evening, just 24 hours after he'd shot Bo Bowenkamp, he was back at the D&G Tavern in Skidmore, drinking a beer, and he jokingly asked the barman, What was all the commotion about last night? Was there a burglary in the grocery store? To say that his arrogance knew new bounds would be an understatement. Worse still was the idea that the law had once failed to stop Ken McElroy from doing uh, whatever he wanted. Bill Everhart, one of the locals who'd once acted as a marshal for Skidmore, is quoted as saying, If a man shoots an unarmed man at point-blank range, he ought to be kept in jail until try. Yeah, fuck, preach, Bill. Come on! All of the documentaries on Ken Rex McElroy would tell you that the shooting of Bo Bowenkamp was the last straw. But it wasn't, not even close. For the next year, the Bowen camps would continue to live in fear. The people of Skidmore had decided to keep to their philosophy of if you don't bother Ken McElroy, he won't bother you. And the Bowen camps felt abandoned by both their neighbors and the law. Their daughter, Cheryl Brown, explains that, quote, Nobody understood what it was like to wake up every morning afraid to be scared and nervous all day long and terrified when the dark came and you couldn't see him. And every time there was a noise in the night, to prowl the windows and wonder if everything was okay in town. That's how it was for me. So the Bowen camps did what we're told any good and proper American would do. They armed themselves and prepared for the day when they would come face to face with Ken Rex McElroy. The Bully of Skidmore, Missouri. After shooting Bo Bowenkamp, McElroy turned himself into a boogeyman. Anyone who dared to show the Bowenkamps any kind of support would start to receive phone calls during which a deep voice would say things like, 
if you don't mind your own business, will have to hurt you. And believe me, this is the only family-friendly threat we can include here, since the others all describe the vile ways in which you would mutilate or disfigure members of the family. <laughs> the McElroys would drive past their homes and places of business at all hours of the day and night, their guns proudly displayed in the back windows of their pickups. The people of Skidmore began to fear the sound of McElroy trucks. The way that slowly drive past their houses at night, pausing just long enough to rev their engines and ensure that the family knew who was waiting outside before they drove off again. Soon the McElroys are haunting not only the Bowen camps, but everybody who might be a witness against Ken McElroy at his trial. This included the families of the four teenage boys who'd seen McElroy approach Bo that afternoon. Red Smith, who'd been the barman at the D&G Tavern on the day of the shooting, Glenn Clement, the owner of the tavern, David Dunbar, the town marshal, and the family of Corporal Dean Stratton, the deputy who'd arrested him. They all received calls along the lines of, if your husband testifies at the trial, several members of your family are going to die, or your house is going to burn. And almost every single one of them armed themselves for the day when they had to defend themselves against Ken McElroy. Only Bo and Sheriff Estes from the Nodaway County Sheriff's Department were required to testify against Ken McElroy in his preliminary hearing, and he was charged with one count of felony assault in the first degree. The date of this hearing was the 5th of September 1980, and once again, he was released on bond. But McFadden, McElroy's lawyer, did what he could to have the court date moved to a later date. McLean speculates that McFadden had hoped that the still injured Bo Bowen Camp would pass away before the trial could commence. After all, he was 70 years old, had suffered a grievous injury, and he was obviously very, very weak. It would take way too long to get into all of the sneaky and devious ways in which McFadden managed to move the court date, but eventually it was set for the 25th of June 1981, almost a year after Bo Burnkamp had been shot. So he's just cruising around free man for a year. That's insane. Especially as he's up to all of this shady shit, which is the reason he should be in prison, waiting this trial, which then he'd want sooner. McFadden had managed to ensure that the trial was held in Bethany, then two and a half hours east of Skidmore, by arguing that jurors from Nottoway County and its surrounds would be prejudiced against Ken McElroy and wouldn't give them a fair trial. And he wasn't wrong, the jurors had no idea who Ken McElroy was when he entered the courtroom that morning. McElroy admitted that he'd shot Bo Burnkamp, but claimed that it had been in self-defense. His truck had broken down, he pulled into B&B groceries, loading dock, and then Bo threatened him with a butcher's knife and told him to get off his property. McElroy fired his shotgun as a warning to Bo, he hadn't realized that it wounded the old guy. According to McLean, the jury thought that the two men had simply argued, resulting in Bo getting shot. Ken McElroy was found guilty of second-degree assault and was sentenced to spend two years in prison. He was granted 25 days in which to file a motion for a new trial, after which the court would hand over their sentence and send McElroy to jail. At last, and two years for attempted murder is just a joke. This lawyer is incredible. Saul Goodman. That meant for now, McElroy was once again a free man. The Petition in September 1980, Ken McElroy drew his shotgun on a couple in St. Joseph after they narrowly escaped hitting his truck with their own. He was arrested and charged with exhibiting a deadly weapon in a rude, angry, and threatening manner. The couple would later revoke any statements they'd made against him. Shocking, we know, so he wouldn't spend any more time in jail, but since he was still under a bond for shooting Bo Bowenkamp, the state prosecutor got the judge to add another 10,000 as a condition of his bond. As a result, Ken McElroy wasn't allowed to carry a weapon either on his person or in any of his vehicles, or he'd go to prison. How is that just something that is being introduced now? Come on, man. He was on bond for a crime that he committed of shooting a guy in the neck. And it's like, no, you can keep your guns unless we say you can't. So obviously they have the ability to say you can't have guns. So why the f*** didn't they do that earlier on? But McElroy wasn't planning on spending a single day in jail. According to his family, his entire demeanor had changed in the months leading up to his trial. He became obsessed with the residents of Skidmore and had asked his friends and informants what they were saying about him. He became paranoid and was convinced that everybody was out to kill him, going so far as to threaten anyone who simply drove past his farm on the way to town. He even made contingency plans with his women and children, telling them what to do if the worst happened to him. He reportedly told an acquaintance that if the residents of Skidmore came for him, I'm going to take a few of them with me. And he was right to be paranoid. He was the most hated man in the four counties surrounding Skidmore, and more and more people were discussing how they were going to protect themselves against him, with rumors spreading that more than one person was willing to confront him on the back roads and make it look like an accident. <laughs> Good. 
good. Vigilante justice, yes! Ken McElroy and his women were almost a constant presence in Skidmore, their guns proudly displayed in their pickups, and the residents of Skidmore took whatever protections they could against him, not even allowing their kids to walk home alone. Whenever the McElroy trucks entered town, the call would go out, and the burn camps would shore up their store as if they expected to be placed under siege. Cheryl explains that, quote, day after day he sat on the street in front of mom and dad's house, the town emptied out every time he came to town. Everyone was so uncomfortable and scared. The guys down at the pool hall didn't like to be around when he was in town, I suppose because they were nervous and scared too. You just couldn't be sure what was going on in his mind. On the 30th of June, 1981, Ken McElroy and Trina drove into town in two separate pickup trucks. McElroy's Silverado had a gun rack in the back window, but it was empty. The gun rack in Trina's truck, however, had a rifle hanging from it. The couple walked into the D&G Tavern and went up to Pete Ward, an army veteran and one of the elders on the municipal council and his two sons. McElroy told Pete that he had a gun he wanted to show him, and Trina went to fetch the rifle from her truck, coming back with an M1 rifle that had a bayonet attached to it. McElroy showed it to the patrons of the tavern, took out a clip and loaded the rifle in full view of the entire tavern, and then pointed it at various patrons in the bar, describing exactly how he was going to shoot and kill Bo Bowenkamp. Pete Ward and his sons left the tavern, fetched their own weapons from their trucks, and stood watch in front of the B&B grocery for the rest of that afternoon. Legend. Pete Ward. Respect. Their response to Ken McElroy's taunt was to call a war, and Pete War wasn't the kind of man who'd tolerate McElroy's usual scaring tactics, a reportedly telling onlookers that if that son of a bitch comes this way with that rifle, I'm going to blow him away. Fucking legend. <laughs> Pete War's just like, I've had enough of this shit. I've had enough of your shit, Ken. <laughs> He watched as McElroy drove out of town, and when he got home that evening, he called Sheriff Estes and asked him what the town's options were. The response was that they had to file affidavits with the court. The next day, Pete took the affidavits to the court himself. He hoped that the sheriff's department would finally do something about Ken McElroy. The whole town hoped that he'd be arrested and kept behind bars until his trial took place. Yes, he should have never been out from behind bars. He has an insane criminal record. Instead of ordering his arrest, the state prosecutors filed a petition on the 2nd of July 1981 asking that Ken McElroy's bond should be revoked, and a hearing was scheduled for the 10th of July 1981. Now the Wards and the Clemens joined the long list of families in Skidmore that McElroy considered to be his enemies. Just to give you a better idea of just how many people were on that shit list, included the Bowen Camps, the Sumis, the Kennys, the Barretts, the Browns, Warrens, Wards, the Clemens, the families of the four boys who'd had bribed the day shot Bow and Corporal Stratton, his wife and their daughters, dude. <laughs> People are looking for excuses to kill you, dude. People have said openly that they're like, Yeah, no, let's do it and make it look like an accident. Multiple times. Accidents happen every day. But unlike the Bowen camps, the Wards and the Clements had been farming the area for almost 100 years, and they had a lot of friends in the four counties surrounding Skidmore. Cheryl describes how the tide seemed to turn against McElroy once the petition was filed. For me and my family, there was a sense that something was going to happen one way or another. Either they would revoke his bond and put him in prison, or the tension would finally break someone and they would get rid of him, or at least attempt to. I can't say that anyone thought that way, but there was a feeling of some kind of inevitability. The hearing was to be held on Friday the 10th of July 1981. In the week leading up to that hearing, P. Ward had called on his friends and neighbors and asked them if they'd be willing to drive in a caravan towards Bethany, where the hearing was to be held. The idea was that McElroy couldn't get to any witness if they were protected by a whole caravan of people, and all of them agreed. Pete Ward, he's the hero of today's story. However, it wasn't to be, since that Wednesday, McFadden managed to get the hearing postponed until the 20th of July 1981. But news of the proposed escort had reached McFadden's ears, and he wanted McElroy to stay out of Skidmore. But Ken McElroy responded with his usual arrogance, saying that, Nobody can keep me out of anywhere. I go where I want, when I want. I'm not afraid of anyone. He had it coming. These days, big events and meetings can be planned and cancelled via text or messaging services within a heartbeat, but this was the early 1980s, and on the morning of the 10th of July 1981, the news that the hearing had been postponed hadn't yet reached every single person who'd agreed to escort the four witnesses to Bethany. According to some reports, the pickup trucks began to arrive at Skidmore at 6.30 that Friday morning, and by 8am, they lined both sides of Elm Street. The farmers were from all of the four counties that McElroy had been raiding and stealing from for over 20 years, and when news 
spread that the hearing had been postponed. Someone proposed that they hold a meeting instead and decide once and for all what they were going to do about Ken Rex McElroy. They're like, I had enough of this shit. Get the whole town together. This is some extrajudicial justice. We're all going to decide whether he's going to be murdered or not. <laughs> Let's just murder this fucker. If we all do it, they can't put us all in prison. <laughs> I love this shit. This is about to get good. The Legion was unlocked and soon almost 60 people were gathered inside, including the mayor and Dave Dunbar, who'd since retired as town marshal. The discussion turned heated and there was more than one person who suggested they should just kill McElroy and get it over with. Pete Ward is credited for insisting that they keep to the letter of the law. Pete Ward, straight up legend. And they called Sheriff Estes for advising about what legal options they had. Sheriff Estes drove to Skidmore to attend the meeting, and in the end, he proposed that they start a neighborhood watch to keep an eye on Cal McElroy. But he joked, if McElroy shot any one of them, they were within their rights to return fire. <laughs> Just to let you know, if that's if if you wanted to kill him in defense because he shot at you, you absolutely can. Even if he shoots safe. <laughs> nice, he didn't really say that, but you know, they're all looking for any reason, aren't they? Then someone notified them that Ken McElroy had just arrived in town and the whole atmosphere in the hall changed. It's important to remember that those people had been gathered in the Legion Hall since well before 8 a.m. that morning. It was now close to 10 a.m. The news of McElroy's arrival caused a spark and a mob was born. Someone suggested that they should just go and keep an eye on him. Let's all go over there with our guns and keep an eye on him. <laughs> that sounds a good plan. The Legion all emptied out. Sheriff Estes got into his car and left town. A group headed towards the D&G Tavern, and the rest of the men who'd attended the meeting spread out along Elm Street, their focus on the tavern, where Ken McElroy was drinking a beer with Trina at his side. According to Trina, they'd been at the farm when one of McElroy's sisters arrived just after 9.30am, informing him that the people of Skidmore were having a meeting in order to decide what to do with him. McElroy didn't stop to change his clothes, he didn't ask anyone else, along to act as backup, and he didn't take a rifle. He just ordered his daughters to stay home, told Trina to get into the Silverado, and drove into town. Trina knew that something was going to happen the moment she saw how quiet the town was. To quote, It seems so strange. Vehicles were lining the street when we arrived in town, but no people were anywhere. We walked into the tavern, and it was empty. Then all of a sudden, it just filled with people. They were giving everybody beers, but nobody paid for them. <laughs> Ah, oh, you mean like, oh shit, what's happening? Just gonna go to the bathroom, I'll be right back. And then just like through the window and escape. According to Red Smith, who was the bartender that day, some of the men made a point of staring at Ken McElroy, doing their best to let him know that he wasn't welcome. But McElroy ignored them. He continued to drink his beer, making small talk with whomever was unlucky enough to be near him. But at his side, Trina was going more anxious by the minute as more men entered the tavern, staring daggers at them. Finally, McElroy finished his beer, bought a six-pack and a pack of cigarettes, and then left the tavern with Trina at his side. <laughs> it's like when you're like in a new town or whatever, and you're just like, I'm just going to pop into this pub and have a quick beer. And then you immediately realize it's just one of those pubs that is just filled with like, a bunch of locals where no one else ever goes and you're just sitting down and you're like <laughs> and the barman comes over he's like drink and you're like yeah i have a beer <laughs> and you're just sitting there desperately out of place in some like locals hangout <laughs> oh uncomfortable they got into the silverado and trina watched as a group of men followed them out of the tavern and surrounded the truck mcelroy stared them down lit a cigarette and started the pickup allowing the roar of its v8 engine to rattle the windows in the tavern trina realized that they were in danger but mcelroy didn't move he just continued to stare at the men surrounding the truck meeting their gazes and letting them know that he saw them silently challenging them to make Make the first move as he slowly blew out a cloud of smoke. Trina saw the first rifle and tried to warn McElroy, but it was too late. The back window exploded, and Trina screamed, and then the shots rained down on the Silverado. Jack Clement yanked the passenger open and dragged her out of the pickup, yelling at her to get down or they'll shoot you too. The Silverado's engine roared angrily as McElroy's foot landed on the gas pedal, drowning out the sound of gunfire. Then the streets emptied. Pickups pulled out of their parking spaces and raced away and Trina's terrified cries became muffled when Jack Clement dragged her into the bank and called for help. The roaring Silverado started smoking, the screaming engine seized, and within minutes the town was quiet and empty. The news of Ken Rex McElroy's death spread like wildfire, and more than one person admitted to feeling a sense of relief. It's like, oh no, he's dead. What a shame. According to Trina, though, one woman walked over to her while she was cowering in fear on the bank's floor and said, you left us no choice. I didn't see a thing.
Now, we don't usually continue telling the bad guy's story once he's dead at his own hands, gone to prison, or sat down in the electric chair, but in this case, Ken McElroy is supposed to be the murder victim, right? Oh, yeah, 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 who cares? <laughs> Well, usually the victim would be found by a family member, a neighbor, a concerned citizen, or a hiker, and then call the police, and an investigation would be launched to find out exactly who had killed them. And in the case of Ken Rex McElroy, at least 60 people had been on Elm Street when the first shots were fired. Cheryl Brown told Harry McLean that she'd watched the entire incident take place from a hideout inside the B&B grocery. Two bank clerks had watched the crowd gather around Ken McElroy's truck from the bank's windows, and at least a dozen people were inside the tavern when the first shot was fired. But not one of them bothered to call the police. Half an hour after McElroy was shot, Richard McFadden received a call from Ken McElroy's brother Tim to let him know that McElroy had been killed. McFadden was the one who called the sheriff's department to let him know that there'd been a shooting in Skidmore. Not Trina, not Tim, nor any of McElroy's friends in Skidmore. Friends. No friends. No money. Plenty enemy. The deputies and ambulance services arrived a good hour after Ken McElroy had died. Sheriff Estes arrived soon after, and he reportedly yelled at the people who stood around and watched as his deputies studied the Silverado, telling them that you weren't supposed to blur him away, goddammit. <laughs> Is he really upset? This guy's been terrorizing his town and the surrounding counties. The ambulance took McElroy's body away, and the deputies started looking for any evidence of who'd shot and killed McElroy. They found a few bullet casings, but no one volunteered to help look or give a witness statement regarding what had happened that morning. We need some help finding evidence about who shot this guy. Nah, I mean, I, I can't. I've got, I've got to return some videotapes. Really sorry, just so busy today. So busy. Police reports would later say that at least 10 rifle shots had hit the Silverado. The coroner's report explained that Ken McElroy had definitely been hit twice, and one of them was a headshot that had killed him instantly. The bullet belonged to a 30-30 and 22 caliber Winchester hunting rifle. Based on the bullets that were retrieved, there were three shooters, and one of them had likely used a shotgun. <laughs> he was destroyed. Fatality. Legally, Ken McElroy's death was a mess. The state prosecutor couldn't be involved since he'd found McElroy guilty of assault just two weeks earlier. Sheriff Estes wasn't allowed to investigate his death either since he'd been at the meeting that morning, and when he asked what would happen if someone shot and killed McElroy, Sheriff Estes had jokingly said, if that happens, it happens, as long as I don't know anything about it. Ah. <laughs> I fucking love this. It's like douchebag is a douchebag, commits horrible crimes, keeps getting off on them, and then the town murder him. And then the police don't care. And then the legal system does nothing. Ah, God damn. I thought we didn't like vigilante justice, Emma, but this is so good. And then he drove out of town just as the men who'd been at that meeting left to confront McElroy. Think of that what you will. Yeah, he's just like, I'm gonna leave now. If something bad happens, well, something bad happens. <laughs> See you guys later. I definitely won't be around. The policeman is leaving. The investigation was handed over to the Northwest Missouri Investigative Squad, aka Nomis, which, uh, funnily enough, is my name backwards. <laughs> And later, the FBI would be brought in to investigate the murder of Ken Rex McElroy and the conduct of Sheriff Estes. No miss had the cause of death, the caliber of weapons that were used, and even a good idea of exactly where the shooters had been standing when those 10 shots were fired. What they didn't have was the murder weapon or any credible witnesses who were willing to point fingers at the men responsible. Whenever Nomis showed up to interview the potential witnesses, they were shut down, and one Nomis officer was quoted as saying, They aren't cooperating with us. They just aren't interested in talking with us. Harry McLean makes an interesting observation in his book In Broad Daylight when he says, The citizens of Skidmore had learned the basic rule of the criminal justice system. No witness, no case. And it's ironic that Ken McElroy's tactics had essentially kept his killers from being arrested themselves. The men who shot Ken Rex McElroy. It's not to say that no one talked to the police. After McElroy was shot, Trina fled to the state patrol headquarters in St. Joseph, convinced that the people of Skidmore were going to kill her too. There, she gave the state troopers a full statement, identifying Dale Clement as one of the shooters. Dale Clement would be interviewed a day later, and he pointed the finger at a guy called Gary Dowling. At least three people gave similar statements, but the Novus officers didn't obtain a warrant for their arrest, and they didn't search their home or vehicles. The third shooter was seen holding the shotgun, but no one could identify him. All of the witnesses were represented by 
by the same attorney, and they all recanted their statements within a day of making them. Their attorney was also the same person who was representing Dale Clement, since can we all say, I smell a conspiracy. Trina and McFadden insisted that Nomis wasn't doing its job, with Trina saying that Nomis was dragging his feet and was not trying to do anything about the murder. I don't see anything done yet. After Nomis and the FBI had conducted their investigations, a coroner's jury found that there was enough evidence to prove that a crime had taken place and a grand jury was called. The grand jury would find that there wasn't enough evidence to indict anyone for the murder of Ken Rex McElroy, and the case was essentially put to rest. I feel just like we've explained grand juries before on this channel, but it's always like a surprising thing to me, is the grand jury is not like some sort of special big jury, it's just a jury that they put together to see if they take a case to court. Of course, it wouldn't be the end of the story. Skidmore became the vigilante town that had murdered their town bully. Trina would go on television stating that, I hope they just remember that McElroy never kneeled down to them. They'll never forget him, because there will never be none like him. He was the best. Oh my god, you have like the Stockholm Syndrome to the max. Oh, which is, of course, debatable. She would continue to defend Ken McElroy for his crimes publicly for the next four years, saying that they made most of it up. He was just a man who would stand up for his rights. A man who the town hated you so much they got together in a big group to murder you. <laughs> Bro, they... Holy sh when she was asked about her history with McElroy, her claims of molestation, abuse, and rape, the fact that he'd shot and killed her dog and burned her parents' house down, she said that none of it was true. He'd never abused her. The house burned down due to faulty wiring. He was good to her and doted on the kids. Of course, all of this was said with a blank expression on her face and tears that arrived on cue. McFadden was at her side during every television appearance, coaching her on what to say, and when he wasn't, her story fell apart. Why does he still care? His client's dead. What's McFadden looking to gain here? He knows he's a prick. He must. He knows he's guilty of many, many terrible things. Why is he even after his death? Who's he getting paid by? In 1984, McFadden had Trina suing the town, the county, the sheriff, the mayor, and Del Clement for the wrongful death of Ken McElroy. There we go. That's where it is. Asking for $6 million in damages. Eventually, she got sick of the pressure McFadden was placing on her and ordered him to settle. She received $17,500 in total, packed up her children, and left to start a new life. $17,500. $6 million it is not. Life Post McElroy When I first started researching Ken McElroy, I wasn't sure if he deserved his fate. I changed my mind when I learned of his women and how he treated the young girls that he groomed until they trusted him, but it's a pity that his children continued to suffer for his crimes. A few days after his death, a jeep drove past Alice's house in Maryville, and two men fired at her three children, missing her daughter by inches. What the f*** are you up to? These are just children. Two days later, they were asked to leave the house since the neighbors didn't want Ken McElroy's kids around. Eventually, Alice moved to Fawcett, enabling her children to get away from the hatred people in Skidmore and its surrounding town still felt towards their father. A year after his death, his house on the McElroy farm was torched one night. No one knows who lit the match, no one complained, and it was never investigated. McLean interviewed Trina in 1987 and reports that she is happy and healthy. When he asked about her life with McElroy, she said that she only ever did what she was told for fear that she'd be shot or beaten, but after his death, quote, I've changed. I don't have to hold my head down to nobody anymore. I can look up at people and not have to worry about looking at the wrong person and getting in trouble over it. Okay, so she was like being like just pressured the whole time. God damn. The town of Skidmore is still known as the town that killed Ken McElroy, and some of his residents believe that the town is cursed since at least three horrific crimes have taken place there since McElroy's death. Sadly, the town is dying, and in 2020 it only had 240 residents. But all of these years later, uh, one thing is still as true as the day he was killed. No one will admit to who had shot and killed Ken Rex McElroy. Dismembered Appendices Number 1. No one is sure of exactly how many children Ken McElroy had fathered, but by my count, there were at least 16 little McElroys running around at the time. Number 2. Five days after Ken McElroy's murder, the entire McElroy clan withdrew their money from the bank in Skidmore and have mostly avoided the town ever since. Number 3. His brother Tim continued to live on the McElroy farm with their mother Mabel. By all accounts, he didn't blame the town for what had happened to his brother, but he never visited the town either. 
4. Dale Clement passed away in 2009. Although it insisted for years that he had nothing to do with McElroy's death, some people still consider him to be the man who saved Skidmore from Ken McElroy, which should tell you everything you need to know about how the public viewed the murder. Number 5. Trina married a man named Howard Williams two years after Ken McElroy's death and had six children in total. She passed away on the 24th of January 2014 at the age of 55, and according to obituary, she lived a happy and normal life post McElroy. Number 6. Author Harry McLean was a successful lawyer before the reports of Ken McElroy's murder drew him to Skidmore. His book in broad daylight was adapted into a television film of the same name and was updated in 2006 to include even more details regarding the investigation. I definitely recommend that you check it out since this script barely touches on everything that had gone on in Skidmore during McElroy's reign of terror. Number 7. According to Harry McLean, Richard McFadden was so proud of his portrayal in the book that he bought copies for every member of the Missouri State Senate and had McLean autograph each and every one of them before he hand-delivered them. He also didn't have any regrets about how he acted defending Ken McElroy, claiming that he'd simply been doing his job. Yeah, and he was doing a bloody good job of it. I was quite impressed by his law. His lawyering ability was very, very strong, even though his client was a douche. Um, yeah, that's all I do. They do their jobs. This has been an episode of The Casual Criminalist. Thank you so much for being here, listening, watching, however you consume the show. And I'll see you next time.